していきますね。All right, here we go. Verse one. I hope that you have a Bible in front of you and you're reading right along with me. If not, it's okay. You can see it on the screen. But I'd love for you to grab a pen and a Bible and to just start marking your own up, your own Bible up, and kind of learn how to read it that way on your own. Either way, here we go. After this, Jesus went to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias.、Um, I we recently got to go to Israel and just a last two months ago, and it was、uh, an amazing trip. And one thing that stood out to me is that the Sea of Galilee is not very big.、Uh, I mean, you could see across it east to west and and almost north to south. It's only like 13 miles long. And、uh, one thing that, even though I've been studying the Bible now half my life,、um, I just never really put together that sometimes in the Scripture when it says the Sea of Tiberias or the Lake Gennesaret or that all all of those terms, like it says here, are the Sea of Galilee. Okay, there's really only the one body of water up in the north of Israel, and then the Jordan River going from the Sea of Galilee to the Dead Sea. So, if you see the Sea of Tiberias and the Sea of Galilee, same place, same body of water, it's really a lake,、um, but it maybe would be called different things based on which town you're in. So that's how that worked. And a large crowd was following him because they saw the signs. That he was doing on the sick.、Um, I actually, I actually do feel compelled to just pause for a second and just remind you.、Um, I know I repeat myself oftentimes, but when it comes to the purpose of this,、uh, we're not just here to academically study. I want to encourage you to, as you're listening to me and as you're reading on your own, to just simply say, Holy Spirit, what do you have for me? What do you want to speak to me today? And what do you want me to change in my life because of this? So, let's do that. <laughs> okay. Um, I, I get. I don't know why it made me think of that, but just because I I saw this word because and and for me like things just stick out. So it's like they were following him because, and it just makes me think, like just step out of the scripture and apply to my own life. What are the what are the becauses in my life that I go after Jesus? What are the becauses in my life that I want Jesus? You know, it says they followed him because they. Saw signs that he was doing on the sick,、um, but like, what are what is your because? You know, I I think if we're really honest, sometimes our because is kind of like them. Like, oh, we see that Jesus can do good things for us, and so we follow him. But ultimately, our because should be because we recognize that he's God, and no matter what gift. He gives us, no matter what healing he gives us, no matter what blessing he gives us, it, is it because number one, he's he's worthy of praise, he's worthy of our life being laid down, no matter what he does for us, I, and number two, is is your desire relationship with him first, relationship above any gift that he might give you or healing that he might bring you. So, I'm not saying that these guys had bad motivation. It just Those are the sort of things that I think about when I'm I'm reading, and that's kind of the point of this video is to share with you how I do my devotionals and what I think about. So, what's your because? Jesus went up on a mountain, and there he sat down with his disciples. Now the Passover, the feast of the Jews, was at hand. We don't have time to get into this probably, but the Passover, extremely important meal. Um, the meal that they celebrated all the way since they left Egypt, the night that they got delivered from Egypt through Moses, was because of the Passover. The death angel came and took the life of every firstborn in the nation, unless you had blood on the doorframe of your house, in which case the death angel passed over your house. That's where it gets its name, and the blood on the doorframe is a complete representation of and foreshadowing of. The blood of Jesus covering us, and death passing over us because of that covering. Lifting up his eyes, then, and seeing that a large crowd was coming towards him, Jesus said to Philip, "Where are we to buy bread so that these people may eat?" He said this to test him, for he himself knew what he would do. Interesting. I don't know that I've noticed Jesus testing his disciples. Hmm. 
maybe more examples. That's just interesting to me. It's like you hear the the Pharisees a lot of times come up to Jesus to test him. They wanted to test him and catch him in his words, but I don't I don't I don't can't remember a lot of times that he tested his disciples and specifically says that. I don't know. I don't know if it makes a difference, but if you know of other examples, uh, leave them in the comments. I'd love to hear. The other day I said, um, yeah, I don't know which feast they were going to Jerusalem for. What are the three feasts? And somebody, a friend of mine messaged me and he said, hey, I was watching your video. These are the three feasts. Um, and so that was really cool to have people engage with the questions that I have. And hopefully I can answer some questions that you have. And together as a community, we can grow. So he tested Philip because he knew what he would do. Philip answered him, 200 denarii worth of bread would not be enough for each of them to get a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There is a boy here that has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they for so many people? Yeah, not a ton of food for, you know, how many is it? This is going to be the 5,000. And Jesus said, Have the people sit down. Now there was much grass in the place, and the men sat down, about 5,000 in number. So 5,000, by the way, when it says the men, uh, I think that the idea is that that would be 5,000 just men, and so plus women and children, so maybe 10 to 15, maybe more, 1,000. Um, now, I think it could be 5,000 total, um, but... There's some arguments that say that they would have only counted the men. I don't know. Either way, 5,000, 10,000, 15,000, still an incredible miracle. Still a lot of people, no matter how you slice that bread. Uh, so this is, what, this is what happens. Jesus then took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated. So also the fish, as much as they wanted. And when they had all eaten their fill, he told his disciples, gather the leftover fragments, then nothing may be lost. I love that they had their fill. Jesus took care of them. He gave them the fish and the bread, and they had their fill. So they gathered them up and filled 12 baskets with fragments of the five barley loaves from the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten. When the people saw the sign that he had done, they said, This is indeed the prophet who is to come into the world. So they had five left over. I've never noticed this. Interesting. So he started with five. So they gathered them up and filled twelve baskets with the fragments from the five barley loaves that were left over. Five loaves filling 12 baskets. Okay, so it wasn't five loaves left over. 12 baskets left over. Interesting. I don't know if it matters, but numbers in the Bible oftentimes matter. 12 is a number that they like to use a lot. 12 disciples, 12 tribes. Anyway, these are the things I think about. All right, this is indeed the prophet that was going to supposed to come into the world. The prophet, the final prophet. Well, not really final prophet. The Messiah. The great prophet. Perceiving that they were about to come and take him by force and make him king, Jesus withdrew again to the mountain by himself. That's interesting. When evening came, his disciples went down to the sea, got in a boat, and started across the sea to Capernaum. So I've been to Tiberias and to Capernaum. They're not that far apart from each other. I mean, like, you, you probably could have, could see be interesting to see how far they are I don't think it's more than a couple miles so they get in the boat they go to Capernaum and then the sea became rough because of strong wind blowing and they had rowed about three or four miles 
they saw Jesus walking on the sea coming near the boat, and they were frightened. And he said to them, It is I, do not be afraid. And they were glad to take him into the boat, and immediately the boat was at the land in which they were going. So I don't know, immediately the boat was there, they had gone three or four miles, maybe that's the distance, three, four, five miles. Or it's further and it was just like Jesus shows up and immediately they're there by miracle. Either way, Jesus is beginning to do, to do more and more uh, big miracles, visual miracles, and in front of a lot of people. Uh, I mean, the feeding the 5,000 is a lot of people, and the walking of water on water, I mean, I suppose multiplying food to feed 5,000 people is a great miracle in and of itself, but walking on water is, is also an insane miracle. So more and more things that he's beginning to do. On the next day, the crowd remained on the other side of the sea. The crowd that remained on the other side of the sea saw that there had been only one boat there, and that the Jesus had not entered the boat with his disciples, but that his disciples had gone alone. Other boats from Tiberias came near the place where they where they had eaten the bread after the Lord had given thanks. Interesting that. Interesting that it goes out of the way to say that the Lord had given thanks. Hmm. I don't know why that's just, I mean, it does tell us up here that when he had given thanks, he distributed it to those who were seated, you know. And you would expect that, of course. Like, sure, he's sure he's in a prayer, you know, but this is interesting though. You know, the next day after all this big miracle happened, I've never noticed this before. Why does John go out of his way to say, when they came near the place that they had eaten the bread after the Lord had given thanks? I mean, it, it, it seems to me that that means that the giving thanks part of the whole the whole thing had to have been either longer or bigger than just like a simple prayer that you say before every meal. I don't know for sure, but it's just interesting that like, when you say, and they came, came near the place that they'd eaten the bread after this great amazing miracle or something like that, you know? But it just says after the Lord had given thanks. I just think there's something there. Like maybe the giving thanks part is a little bit bigger than I would have thought. Hmm. I think either way you slice it, that's a, gonna be a good word for today, giving thanks. So when the crowd saw that Jesus was not there, nor his disciples, they themselves got into the boats and went to Capernaum, seeking Jesus. Now we're gonna see in a little bit Jesus' um, prediction or uh, prophetic word or, you know, thoughts on why they're seeking him this time. And then, you know, we can see if it's true and we can analyze the own, our own reasons why we, why we seek him. If you were there that day and then you followed him, what would the reason be for why you followed him? When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Jesus answered them, truly, truly. Amen, amen. I got an amazing testimony yesterday, side note. I got an amazing testimony yesterday that um, some friends of mine who have been with me on Bible Time since the beginning of 2020 are now re-watching uh, this new version of Bible Time and their kids oftentimes watch it with them and they were watching it and heard everything about the truly, truly, amen, amen, let it be, and all that. And then that night during uh, nighttime prayers, uh, their kid said, truly, truly, at the end of the prayer, instead of just amen. And he's like, I know what that means. And so, man, I love hearing testimonies like that. And so anything, uh, uh, any testimony that you have of, of how this ministry or these videos help you, please send them to me. Um, I would love, I'd love to hear those from you. You can email me at hello at logiccostministries.com. Uh, anyway, 
it's encouraging for us. So let's jump back in. Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. So he's declaring, you know, why, why, why I think you're following me is not because of signs, but because you ate. So what he's not saying is because you know that I'm God, you know that I'm the Messiah, anything like that. But he's saying, uh, because you had this, this bread, you had the loaves. He's not really addressing the fish, but you had the loaves. And you're going to see why in a second. He's going to use that and turn it as an analogy or metaphor for who he is. Okay. He says, do not work for food that perishes, but for food that endures to eternal life. Here's that term that we're going to see over and over and over again. Which the Son of Man will give you. For on him, God the Father has set his seal. Then they said to him, now listen to this question. Though you're not in this situation Though you're not in this exact scene, though you maybe don't ask the question exactly like this, this is a question that people all throughout history have been asking of God. Now I want you to notice specifically how they ask it, what tense they ask it in, and, um, and then Jesus' response, okay? Listen to this. They said to him, what must we do to be doing the works of God. Okay? I want to point out a few things. Number one, what must we do? We know, of course, that God wants us to do good works, but we have to get this balance between faith and works, between works flowing from relationship, not works in order to try and gain or get some relationship. Okay? And this was part of the struggle that the that the Jesus was addressing as he came. The Pharisees, the legalism, the rules, the Sabbath, all of these things where he's like, hey, y y the point is not you following the rules. The point is knowing me, knowing God, being in relationship, and your obedience flows from relationship. Your legalism is not some attempt to earn righteousness with me. So one of the things that he came to address was works, 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 me doing, me doing, me doing. Okay, so they say, uh, what must we do to be doing the works? Okay, notice there's an S there. That's plural, okay? The works of God. Um, and of course, there's many things that God wants us to do. But notice his response. Jesus answered them, this, singular, is the work, singular, of God that you believe in him who he has sent I love this this is the work of God that you believe in him who he, is, who he has sent that's one work and it's to believe you know what we see is like um, after Jesus silenced the the Sadducees the Pharisees came up to him and they asked him what is the most important question singular and Jesus flips it over and he answers in a plural. The most important commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and to love your neighbor as yourself. So they ask him a singular question, he answers in the plural. Here, they're asking him a plural question. What are all the works that we need to do to do what God requires of us? And Jesus answers in the singular. The work, the only work that you need to do is to believe in the one whom he has sent. Now, what does Jesus know? Jesus knows that if we really believe in him and we really follow him, we are going to do multiple plural works for sure. Why? Because God has prepared good works in advance that we should walk in them, Ephesians 2.10. But what is important to remember is that for us to be right with God, for what does God require of us? It's not 613 commandments. It's not 10,000 works and 10,000 rules and all of these things. It's to believe in Jesus, to follow him, to have that relationship. And then out of that relationship, obedience and works are going to flow. So I think this is an extremely important passage uh, right here and an important thought. All right. 
So they said to him, Then what sign do you do that we may that we may see and believe you? Which, what are you talking about? You, you are the same people that saw him feed five thousand people. That's why you're there. <laughs> We're just always looking for more signs. I know that I am. God, show me, show me, show me. What work will you perform? Our fathers ate manna in the wilderness, as is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Which, that's exactly what Jesus just did. Multiplied and gave them bread from heaven, basically. And Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, pay attention. Listen, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you bread from heaven, but my Father who gives you true bread from heaven. For the bread that for the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Hmm, okay. They said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. Now watch this. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. Now what you're seeing right here is the first of seven I am statements. In the Gospel of John, there are seven statements um, where Jesus makes a declaration about his identity, his purpose, and what he came to accomplish. In many ways, they're statements that can't be applied to anybody else. They're statements that personally and specifically um, uh, spell out who he is and what he came to do. And we're gonna see seven of them throughout this gospel. And uh, there's one of them, and only one of them, that he also applies to believers that when we get there, I'll talk about. But for now, he says this about himself, I am the bread of life, right after saying, the, the true bread of life comes from the Father in heaven, and it is he who is coming to you. I am the bread of life. So, if you eat of Jesus, it is real food, and you won't go hungry. But I said to you that you have seen me and yet do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but to do the will of him who sent me. He spoke on this before. I only exist to do the will of the Father who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up in the last day. This is kind of a side note, but there's not a ton of places in the New Testament that specifically say what the will of God is, um, like in those in those exact terms. I mean, it's obvious that that all of the commandments are the will of God. It's obvious that everything that is prescribed to us is the will of God, um, essentially. But there's only actually a few places that specifically say, this is God's will for you. Um, and so, it's interesting to know. Um, maybe we'll hit on those sometime, but there's only like two or three of them in the New Testament. In this case, this is the will of Him. This is the will of God that sent me, that I should lose nothing of the, what He given me, but raise Him up in the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in Him should have eternal life. Ding, 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 ding. There's that term again. And I will raise Him up in the last day. So the Jews grumbled about Him, because He said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They said, Is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How does He now say, I have come down from heaven? And Jesus answered them, Do not grumble among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. Hmm. Hmm. 
Number one, I find it, it just interesting, the flippy floppiness of these people. Like they, they received the miracle of the feeding. Then they came, they, they obviously were enamored by him enough to travel around and find him again. Um, they came to him because of this great miracle and then they're questioning him and now they're grumbling at his answer because they don't believe him. They're back and forth. So that's just interesting. And number two, as an Arminian, which I am, which is somebody that believes that God wants everybody to be saved and everybody to come to the knowledge of Jesus and that God has not specifically decided that some were created for eternity in hell, um, which is definitely what some people believe. Um, I am, uh, I do believe in free will and I do believe that God wants everybody to know him and that hell was created for the devil and his demons. Although if people reject Jesus, he allows them to go there. But this is a passage that, you know, um, is scripture and we need to take into account. I need to take into account. No one can come to the fa to, to Jesus unless the Father draws Father who sent me draws him. So it's not just about us. Again, it's not just about our works. It's not just about our preaching. It's not just about people making a decision. The Father has to draw. And I will raise him up on the last day. Now this is like the second or third, fourth time we've seen this term. It is written in the prophets that they will, they will all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father except he who is from God, he has seen the Father. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. Ding, ding, there's that term again. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate manna in the wilderness and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven so that one may eat of it and not die. This is the bread, me. He's talking about himself. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for and the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. Interesting. So he's saying like I am the bread, I am the living bread. Um, but he's also tying it to his flesh specifically. And we see him do the same, the same thing when it comes to communion. Uh, you know, he says, this is my body broken for you. And he gives them bread. And then, he, and then he ties his blood to the wine. And he gives them the wine to drink. And so it all kind of ties together. But what Jesus did, like he is our food. He is our life. He is our source. And also what he specifically did with breaking of his body, which is bread, and pouring out his blood, uh, which is the wine, um, is what accomplished salvation for us and reconciliation with God, forgiveness and atonement. The Jews disputed among themselves, saying, How can this man give us flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat, of my f eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Oh my goodness, that is a very intense thing to say. And we're going to see that they did not like that very much. Watch this. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. and I will raise him up on the last day. There's that term again. For my flesh is true food and my blood is true drink. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks of my blood abides in me and I in him. As the living Father sent me and I live because of the Father, so whoever feeds on me, he also will live because of me. This is the bread that has come down from heaven, not like the bread your, the fathers ate and died. Whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. Jesus said, the, said these things in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. Okay, so like a lot, a lot is being said in here about him and his body being bread and his blood and that you need to eat his body and drink his blood, okay? So how are these guys gonna respond? How would you have responded? Watch what happens. When many of his disciples heard it, they said, This is a hard saying, and who can listen to it? But Jesus, knowing in himself that his disciples were grumbling about him, he said to them, 
Do you take offense at this? Then, if you were able to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before, then what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. But there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who those were who did not believe and who it was who would betray him. And he said, This is why I told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted by my Father. And watch this. After this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. Now I know that this is just uh, not really real in the sense of the numerology of it. I just think it's interesting that this is John chapter 6 verse 66. In other words, 666. First time it says that the people in mass turned from him and stopped following him. Those verse numbers weren't in there when it was written, of course. Is it coincidence? Was it set up? I don't know. Either way, I just think that it's interesting. 666, and they could not listen to this teaching. It was, it was just too intense. They could handle the miracles. They loved the miracles. They loved the healing. They loved the feeding. But when it came to him talking about his eating his body and drinking his blood, it was too much. And I don't know. I just think it's important for us to say, like really get to the place where we say, is there anything in my life that could get me to turn from Jesus? Is there anything the world could offer or anything that God asks me to do that I would say that's just not worth it? Luckily, we have the scripture and we know what the word of God is, but it's just interesting to consider. So Jesus said to the 12, do you want to go away as well? And Simon Peter answered him, I love this. I love this. Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. And we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. I like this distinction. We have believed because a belief is something that maybe you don't know for sure. And we have come to know. We believed and now we've also come to know because we've been with you. You, you are the Holy One of God. Where, where else would we go to? We can't go anywhere from, but from with you. Jesus answered them, Did I not choose you, the twelve? And yet one of you is a devil. He spoke of Judas, the son, uh, the son of Simon Iscariot, for he, one of the twelve, was going to betray him. Is there anything that we could go to? I, I just don't think that there's anything else that we could go to but Jesus. There's a lot in here uh, to ponder and consider. I hope and pray that that's at least one of those things spoke to you and you spend a few minutes engaging with God. Keep pressing into God. Keep praying. Keep fasting. It's worth it. Don't give up. I'm so proud of you. And thanks for joining me today. Hey, last thing. If you would maybe just consider um, sharing this video or sharing one of the TikTok or Instagram videos with somebody else or maybe either on your page, um, I just would love to invite more people into this. I know so many people don't take advantage of this time in this season and they're, they want to be close to God, but they're far from God. They don't know how to grow closer to God. And, and so if you found this tool to be helpful, would you consider sharing it with somebody else? That's the only way that the word gets out. So thank you so much. I appreciate every one of you and God bless you.